You're listening to the weekly sermon at Second Baptist Church in Cedartown, Georgia. Second Baptist Cedartown exists to worship God, disciple believers, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 is where we're going to be at this morning. And we're going to uh, look at the first few verses of Joshua chapter 6. Talking about the tools of the kingdom and uh, what the Lord uh, can do with our lives as we trust and as we believe in Him. We've been uh, touching on the fact that we can trust in the promises of God and how His promises reign true every day, just as they reign true for the people of Israel as they crossed over the Jordan, as they uh, trusted in the Lord to lead them into the promised land. And uh, I want to talk about Joshua chapter 6 this morning as they get into uh, the destruction of Jericho, the walls that come tumbling down, a story that I think a lot of y'all are familiar with. Uh, And we're going to start in the first verse of Joshua chapter 6. So let's all stand out of reverence to reading God's word this morning. You found your place. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat. The people shall go up every man straight before him. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I pray that, Lord, you'd stir our hearts as we grow in devotion towards you and apply these words to our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated this morning. <clears throat> We've gotten to the point of the story where the Israelites have crossed over the Jordan River and now they are getting into the promised land and they're overtaking the city of Jericho just as God himself had promised. There is a ceremony that is taking place here that the people of Israel are trusting in the Lord over. And I like what one commentator said about this particular ceremony. He said, elsewhere in the ancient Near East among pre-battle rituals, there is no comparison to it. The ceremony focuses upon a daily movement around Jericho until the climax of the seventh day. Warriors, priests, and the Ark of the Covenant make up the procession. Trumpets are blown and the people raise a shout. Several of these elements point to God's leadership of a military expedition. You come away from this story and you recognize that it is truly God who is the one in charge. Truly God is the one that's going to allow the people of Israel to overtake the promised land, overtake the city of Jericho, to see the walls come tumbling down. We like to sing songs about this, teach our kids this particular story. It's a good story. It's an interesting story. But can I tell you and remind you of this? It is a true story. It's historically accurate. This is what God himself calls to happen for the nation of Israel. And so this is not allegory. This is not just an illustration. This is not just something that we learn from. This is historical and this is true. And we need to recognize that the God who caused the walls to tumble for the city of Jericho and for the nation of Israel to overtake the city of Jericho, the God who caused all of that is the God who orchestrates and leads us even to this day. So, preacher, it's hard to understand. It's hard to think that God really just calls this wall to fall. Did, Did God just tell them to march around seven times and just 
say that this is going to be yours and they're going to blow some trumpets and they're going to shout and these walls are just going to fall down. That's kind of hard to believe, preacher. Well, listen, if you find that hard to believe, we also believe this, that there was a, a person who came to this earth by a virgin birth. We also believe that this person lived a perfect sinless life. We also believe that he died on the cross of Calvary. And we believe this, he resurrected after three days. God is full of miracles. Amen. The Bible is from beginning to end full of miracles. Things that are hard to understand in our finite minds. And yet God calls them to happen. And so this is not some random anomaly in scripture. This is just consistent with the pattern of God. This is consistent with how he has orchestrated our lives and the lives of human history uh, all throughout our existence. But there's an interesting thing that takes place in this particular chapter. There's a chronology of sorts that we should pay attention to. Uh, there is what happens before battle. There's what's hap happening during battle. And there's what happens after battle. And what that points us to in this particular story is that God is in control of all of it. Yeah. Ram's horns were used to prepare the people to go to war. This is a sacred a sacred procession. This is something where they call the people to action. And that's what's taking place here. They're letting the entire nation of Israel know as they blew the ram's horns, there's something that's about to happen. It's critically important for everybody to focus on this one thing. Then this procession normally involves the ark, which it happens here that the ark is central to this particular procession. And it symbolizes the presence of God how he goes with us through whatever circumstance we're facing, but particularly in war here in the Old Testament, that's so critically important. Then the loud shout joins the sound of the trumpets with the warriors of Israel, and they proclaim the victory. They proclaim that it's already won, that it's already something that God himself has delivered them from. So important because there's so many lessons here for us as we trust and as we believe in the Lord. Now I have a little box of illustrations. I have some tools in here. I'm going to be talking about the tools of the kingdom today. So I need, uh, I guess, four kids. I know we got some kids that are back in children's church, but all right, come on, Hattie. I mean, Hattie, <laughs> Hattie's daughter, <laughs> Millie. All right, come on, let's go. Y'all come on down here. I need a couple more, a couple more. Anybody want to, want to volunteer? Okay. Yeah. Come on down. Okay, I have a box of cool stuff in here, and I have some tools in here. And y'all are going to put your hand in here, and nothing's going to bite, and there's not going to be anything that happens, but uh, you're going to tell me what this tool is used for. Can you do that? Maybe? Yeah? Okay. Grab the first thing. <laughs> what is that foreign object? <laughs> what do you think? It's a, what is that? Just whatever you think it is. A cup. Well, I don't know if it's going to hold much. Do you? No? And then it's got this thing. What do y'all think it is? Sifter. Yeah. All, all the old ladies getting ready for Thanksgiving, right? Like, I, I, hey, I didn't hear who said that. That's just... <laughs> A sifter. Y'all know what you do with that? No? You put your McDonald's chicken nuggets in there? And, no, it's, just, it's, it's to sift flour to make flour more, to make flour easier to, you know, cook with. I don't know what it is. <laughs> All right. Here. Don't look. Just grab whatever you, what is that used for? Yeah, paper clip. That's pretty simple, right? I mean, that's not... Let me hold it up for everybody. I mean, this is a big paper clip, too. You ever use paper clips? No? Well, you know, you put paper in there, and especially if you, like, work in an office or something, and you can make sure paper's divided in it. It's really helpful sometimes. All right? Okay, so th that was easier. That was easier than the first one, wasn't it, Billy? All right, what about that? <laughs> now, those are not used. All right, so what? Okay, Q-tips to clean your ears. Would you all agree with that? Okay, let me tell y'all something. This is what's crazy, okay? It says here to use for beauty, for first aid, 
for home electronics. I don't know what, to clean home electronics. This is what it says. You ready for this? Warning, do not insert swab into ear canal. <laughs> like literally the entire world does that with Q-tips. Don't you agree? Yeah. So, but its intended purpose is not for our ears, right? I don't know. Maybe we use that and we're not supposed to use it for it. There's, I think, one more. You want to grab another one, Billy? Uh-oh. <laughs> to clean your teeth. And that's actually, this is, I, yeah, a little flossing thing. I actually think this is kind of cool because you see this, you can clean your teeth with it, but then you can also turn this upside down and you can stab your brothers with it. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> no, you pick stuff out of your teeth, you know, that's pretty cool. But that's what its intended purpose is. All these are tools that we use for different things, right? Y'all give them a hand. They did a good job, didn't they? Y'all can go back and have a seat. Thank y'all. Tools are important to use for their intended purpose. Apparently none of us are using Q-tips for its intended purpose, but they are important. And there are other uses maybe for tools, but it's limited to what we can do with it, especially here on this earth. I mean, we have tools that are, uh, that are useful, but, but they're limited in so many ways. We can't manipulate the tools of this world to do whatever it is we want them to do. Uh, they're limited in what their purpose is. But I want to talk about the tools of the kingdom, especially what we see in Joshua chapter 6, the tools that are utilized in overtaking the city of Jericho. My main point is this, the tools of the kingdom are more powerful than the tools of this world. The tools of the kingdom are more powerful than the tools of this world. You say, preacher, it didn't look like they used tools to overtake the city of Jericho. They didn't use the tools of this world, but they used the tools of the kingdom. And tools are just things that objects that we have in our hands or that we have in our possession that we can use for a specific purpose to accomplish a specific task. Tools help us do something. It's just an object that we use for that particular purpose. But when we think about the tools that God himself utilizes, the tools that God himself implements in our lives, these things are more powerful than anything we could ever conjure up or think to utilize for ourselves. And when I read Joshua chapter 6 and Exactly what God did with the nation of Israel it reminds me of the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. King Jehoshaphat is praying to the Lord and seeking direction from the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord that was given to the king. Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. He, he's surrounded by enemies, the Ammonites and and some other people, that, and, and he says this, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Man, what a statement to say to a king who is supposed to lead his people into battle, who's supposed to have, you know, bear all the burdens of leading his people. And God himself says to King Jehoshaphat, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and let the salvation and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. What a wonderful reminder for us as we fight the battles of our lives today. We're not the Old Testament uh, Israelites. We're not in those specific battles of going out and engaging in physical war. But yet we are faced with difficulty. We are faced with adversity. And we're even faced with persecution from time to time if we are followers of Jesus. And there are tools that should be utilized in living out our lives for God's glory. But it starts with this recognition. Ultimately, our lives are not our own. We belong to the Lord. And so if we belong to the Lord, if we are in his possession, then the things that we go through, the things that we face, ultimately have to be reliant upon the sovereign hand of God. The tools that are utilized in his kingdom. And what does that look like? The first thing I want to look at are the promises of God. This is the main theme of our study through the book of Joshua, the promises of God. 
It's a good reminder for all of us that God still has his promises for his children. He still leads us. This is, we're still living out the fulfillment of God's will for our lives and for the lives of, of those that are in human history and all the people that serve the Lord. And I've mentioned this quote from William Carey, the famous missionary uh, who started the modern missionary movement a few hundred years ago. He said this, the future is as bright as the promises of God. When we look out into the future, when we think about what's coming up around the corner, you and I honestly have no clue what's going to take place in the future, but, but God is in control of all things. Isn't that a wonderful thought to think about? As we sometimes are overcome by anxiety or overwhelmed by the circumstances around us, it is a good thing to remind ourselves of this fact that God is in control. The future is as bright as the promises of God. The promises of God are sure. They're trustworthy and true. They're better than the promises of men. And God told Joshua in verse 2, notice this, the way that God phrases this. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. I have given Jericho into your hand. The word, the Hebrew word for given points to the fact that this act is already purposed in God's mind and in God's heart. And this is about to come into fruition. It's so sure that you can count it as good as done. That what God has said, what God has spoken is so trustworthy, is so reliable. You can go ahead and take it to the bank that this is going to happen. See, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's the same word that's utilized in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, as God is creating the world and as he is bringing all of these things into existence, Genesis 1, verse 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. You shall have them for food. Genesis 1 Verse 29, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth. Same word that's utilized there as the one that's utilized in Joshua chapter 6. The act is done, but yet there is still more to come. When God allowed fruit to come up out of the ground, trees to come up out of the ground, all the herbs and everything else that the ground helps to produce in Genesis chapter 1, that is a deed that was as good as done, and yet God still blesses us. He still pours out his blessings on us, even to this day. He has given to us every plant yielding seed, and he continues to give that to us so that we can have food. God is good to us. The promises of God are just as true today as they were for the nation of Israel. And we may be living in different times. We may be living under different circumstances. We may not have been given this word by God to go and overtake uh, the neighboring city. But this is God's way of leading his people and his promises are true. Now, now listen, I'm not talking about some name it and claim it type of stuff. All right? that's, not, that's not what's taking place here on in Joshua chapter 6. So, so don't leave here and say, I got to go find my city of Jericho. I got to go claim it and I got to walk seven times around. Man, you're just going to look kind of silly all right? if you do that. that that's, that's not how God is speaking to us today. But, but, but it is something that we utilize in God's way in our time. This is, this is not us declaring that this is ours, that this is something that belongs to us. People may say that I'm just going to declare this and it just has to happen. Listen, Jesus never promised health or material possessions. We need to remind ourselves of that. In fact, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you need to die to self. You pick up your cross daily. And I want to remind you of this. Listen, if it's not God's will, it ain't going to happen. And all God's people said, amen. amen. doesn't matter how many times you declare it. How many times you feel down in your heart that this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to take place, and I just need to speak it. There, there is no power in what you declare. There is power in what God has declared. 
what God has said. And when we say something, we just want to repeat what God has already said. So it has nothing to do with what I say, what I proclaim behind the pulpit. There is no power in the words that are coming out of my mouth. There is power in what God himself has already spoken. And we just repeat it over and over and over again, reminding ourselves of what God himself has declared. What God has declared, you can take that to the bank. What God has said, what God has spoken, that's what we lean on. That's what we trust in. That's what we go to time and time again. Listen, when we think about the promises of God, the tools that we utilize for the kingdom purposes that God has uh, given to us to live out our lives for his glory. Listen, this book from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books that make up our Bible, this, these are the promises of God. These are the words of the living God that we trust in, that we believe what God himself has declared. This is truth for us. When we go back to this word time and time again, if we want to utilize the promises of God, we go back to God's word. Secondly, there's another tool that God uses that I think is interesting here in Joshua chapter 6, and it's the people themselves. God utilizes the people of God. We are tools, instruments in the hands of a living and holy God. Now, that may not seem like something we want to be. You don't go and call people tools and expect that to be a compliment. But this is the way that we are utilized by God. We are people utilized for His purpose, for His will. He told the warriors, the priests, and those carrying the ark to march around the walls. On the seventh day, the priests will blow the horns. Everyone will shout and it will cause the walls to fall. There were seven priests blowing seven trumpets, marching seven times around. On the seventh day, there's something there about the number seven. But let's just state the obvious. God could have caused all of this to happen without any single one of them. God could have caused the walls of Jericho to fall and to crumble. God could have caused every single person within the city of Jericho to simply perish and to die. God could have caused any part of this story to happen without the children of the nation of Israel. It teaches us something, though, about how God carries out his will even today. God doesn't need to use people. God is sovereign. He is in control. God controls every single aspect of this universe. When we say things like he's got the whole world in his hands, literally our God has the whole world in his hands. Amen. Nothing happens without the divine providence and sovereignty of God, without his leadership, without his guidance in our lives. And yet he doesn't need people and yet he chooses to use people. For his glory. He chooses to use imperfect people for his glory. People who don't have it all together. People who struggle with life. Who struggle with issues. He chooses to use our, our finite efforts. Our feeble efforts for his glory. You've heard it said. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And I think that's true in a lot of ways. This is the way I think God sees us sometimes. Utilizing us for his purposes. For his glory. Y'all ever seen a, a group of pre-K students or kindergartners get together and uh, the teacher says that one of them is going to be the line leader, or as Maggie Dean likes to say, I'm the yarn leader today. I'm the yarn leader. You've seen that happen in, in kids' classes and everything, and, and I, maybe sometimes you get one kid and the power just goes to their head and they think they're in control of every bit of it. And listen, Ma Maggie was the yarn leader the other day. We were walking through the store somewhere and, and uh, she just declared it. She named it and claimed it and said, I'm going to be the line leader. And uh, man, she walked in front of us and she wanted us to do exactly what she was doing. She was in charge and you better pay attention, right? And, and, and kids sometimes do that, but, but, but teachers intentionally do that a lot of times. Many of y'all as, as teachers, you, you do that intentionally from time to time. Uh, you, you get one student to be the line leader, and the kids love to be the line leader. They love to, to feel like they're involved, that they're doing something, that they're contributing. But the truth is, if they get off track, 
the teacher's going to correct them, right? They're, they're not the ultimate leader. They're, they're, they're still being guided uh, under the leadership of their teacher, but it, it gets them involved. It, it's similar, I think, to what God does with us. Listen, God doesn't need us. We need to remind ourselves of that. God doesn't have to use you for his glory. And yet in his graciousness, in his mercy, he allows you to become a part of his grand and glorious plan. Man, what grace is that? What mercy is that? God uses his church to accomplish his mission today. We're unworthy of such a calling, and yet God intentionally uses people to accomplish his goal. David Platt said the church is plan A for the proclamation of the gospel, and there is no plan B. There is no other people group in this world who has been given the commission to go and to make the name of Jesus known, to go and to make disciples. There's no other collection of people. There's no business. There's no institution. There's no form of government that has been given that commission. It belongs to the church. The mission of God belongs to the people of God. God in his sovereignty chooses to utilize people to accomplish his Goal. And he expects us to participate and involve ourselves in the Great Commission. What's the Great Commission? It's telling others about the gospel and discipling them in the gospel. You know, Barna Research came out not long ago and said that 51% of churchgoers, 51% of churchgoers, those who attend church, do not know what the Great Commission is. How in the world? How in the world can we participate in something that we don't know exists? How in the world can we be involved in being used by God as a tool of God, that God would use us for his kingdom purposes here on this earth. How in the world could we ever be used by God if we don't know what the plan of God is? The Great Commission is the plan to go out into the highways and the byways telling other people about the name of Jesus. The Great Commission is this. Making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Leading them in the Lord, telling people about Jesus. He uses the people of God for his glorious purposes. And when you think about that, it's hard to fathom, it's hard to imagine that God who is sovereign, who is perfect, who is holy, who is righteous, who is just... God who is able to do anything and everything that he wants to do chooses to use people who have fallen, people who don't have it all together, people who are sinful, people who struggle with this life. He chooses to use you and I for his glorious purposes. And here's the wonderful thing, that when God uses us, he forms us, he shapes us into who he wants us to be. He's the potter, we're the clay. And as God changes us and molds us, we become more and more and more like Christ. We have to be honest and say we don't have it all together. We don't do things perfectly, and yet God can use us as a tool, as an instrument for his kingdom, for his glorious purposes. Another tool that's utilized by God in his kingdom, the promises of God, the people of God, and then there's the worship of God. Look at Joshua chapter 6. There is this ceremonial march around the city with the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God. Can you imagine just being there and looking at this ceremonial march? Could you imagine being someone on the inside of the city of Jericho? I don't think that, I don't think that the Holy Spirit gives us access into that perspective. What did the people inside the city walls think about what was taking place? They're probably looking and thinking, what are these crazy folks doing? marching around with these horns, shouting and everything else. And and what in the world do they think is going to happen? But there is this ceremonial march that is God-exalting, that is God-honoring. It's an exercise of dependence on the Lord. This was them declaring and saying that the Lord is with them, that they're trusting in the presence of the Lord, that they know that what God has said, the promises of God are going to come into fruition. They're reminding themselves of that. This was an act of devotion, an act of dependence on a sovereign and a holy God. That's what worship is. When we gather, when we 
come together to sing songs, to pray, to hear the preaching of the word, we're reminding ourselves that we serve a sovereign and a holy God. We worship him in spirit and in truth, and we depend on him. We depend on him for everything that we need for the sustenance of this life. Listen, Hebrews chapter 10 still matters that we would not forsake the assembling of ourselves as some so often do, but that we would gather together for the worship of God. Worship is an act of devotion, is an act of reverence. What they're doing is they are worshiping the Lord here. We were studying in our Sunday school class this morning. We were talking about work in our Sunday school class with the uh, college and career class and how in, uh, in the Bible, work and worship in some parts are utilized as the same word. And so our work can be worship or we can worship God through our work, through what we do. And this act of obedience through this ceremonial march that's taking place, they're trusting, they're believing in the Lord, they're declaring his sovereignty and they're trusting in what he is about to do next. And so the gathering of God's people, it still matters today. The, something that supernaturally happens when God's people come together for his glorious purposes, for worshiping him, for, for lifting up his name. There's something spiritually significant about the gathered assembly of the saints. The Greek term is ecclesia. The assembly, the called out assembly of the saints. Literally, that's where we get the word church. The church is a gathering. People say that we don't come to church, we are the church. Well, that's true, but you should come to church and you should also be the church. Those are two things that go hand in hand. Literally, church means the gathered or called out assembly. We grow in our worship of God as we grow in our fellowship with one another. Iron sharpens iron is what the Bible tells us. Acts chapter 2 tells us this, that the church gathered for the breaking of bread and for prayers. For the teaching of the apostles is what they're told. The public reading of God's word has always been central to that as well. And that's why we start off our services or we have in the middle of our services the public reading of God's word usually in Psalms or some other passage of scripture. But then when I preach, we stand because it's just out of reverence. It's not some sort of ceremonial ritual or anything like that. But we just want to say, listen, this part in our service is important. The proclamation of God's word, what God has said, what God has spoken. The gathered assembly still matters today. And I, I do believe that when we think about alternative ways to watch the service, they can be beneficial in these days. But you have, uh, if you absolutely have to miss those things, but can I tell you this, worshiping online is not the same thing as gathering in person. Amen. It's just not. And it can never replace the gathered assembly of the saints. And, and, and I'll tell you this, that, that we want to continue to offer worship online, alternative means and everything else so you can, so you can listen, so you can study God's word. And I hope people that are watching online, they do that. They participate as they're able to do so online. But, but if that continues for a longer period of time for the Christian, there's still something missing. And what's missing is the gathering of believers in Christ. I had to think real hard in the middle of the pandemic as we celebrated Easter and, and all of these other things, all of these other monumental worship services and stuff, these really important worship, worship services that we have that we missed in 2020 because of the pandemic. I had to think about, could we do the Lord's Supper in our home separately? Some churches decided to do so, and that was fine if, if they felt convinced to be able to do that. But I, I thought to myself, I said, I, I, don't, I don't want us to celebrate the Lord's Supper separately because there's something so important about coming together, yearning for the gathering of God's people and celebrating that as a family. And so we didn't, we didn't participate in that necessarily in the pandemic because I, I wanted us to to yearn for this gathering, to be reminded that there's something spiritually significant about coming together, and there is no substitute for it. There is no substitute. Well, there are excuses or there are things that people say about maybe why they don't come or why they haven't been coming. I, and obviously, if there are health concerns, I, I want to I understand that. I want to want to meet people where they are. And, uh, and help guide them to the word and whatever means that, that would, that would um, 
lead to. But, but if we're honest with ourselves, before the pandemic, there had been this long-standing trend that was leading people away from the gathered assembly of the church. Before the pandemic, there was a decrease, a significant decrease in churches all across America and attendance and everything else. And so, so there are usual reasons or excuses for why people say that they don't come. One is that they don't have time. Some people say, well, just life is so busy, we don't have time to, to, to come to church to get ready and everything else. And listen, I, I'll go ahead and tell you this. If, if time is an issue or whatever and getting ready, just come. Just come and be a part of the church. I, we don't care what you look like or anything else. I mean, uh, you know, bathing helps and that sort of thing. But listen, just come. We don't, I mean, we just want you to be here. And, and you're looking at somebody who I shave once a week and it's for church. It's for the Lord. All right, I shave my neck. But, but no, I mean, we, we don't really care about those things, what you wear and, and whatever else. We just want people to come. But, but some would say, well, we don't have time. We don't have time to devote ourselves to that. And and, and, and maybe we, we convinced ourselves that such a thing was true, but did you know that the average American watches Netflix around three hours a day? <clears throat> Man, it's quiet in here. You know what that adds up to? It adds up to, in the year 2020, it added up to 600 hours per American. That's 25 full days, morning and night. 25 days of your life in a year for the average American that was devoted to watching Netflix, binge watching Netflix. For many of us, I think the vast majority of us, it's not that we don't have time, it's that we don't take the time. We don't prioritize the time. We're asking to come to church. If you come faithfully every week, you come for three, maybe four hours a week. If you come faithfully every week, that's three, maybe four hours a week. And the average American watches three hours of Netflix a day. Oh, I'll preach, it just doesn't keep my attention. It doesn't, it doesn't keep my attention when we come to church and I just get kind of bored or whatever else. And maybe our kids' attention span have changed and... And, and, I, and I've read some things about that. I, I think that there may be some things that are changing with our attention spans. I understand that. Uh, but, but I also want to ask this question. Have you ever seen kids watch those YouTube videos where they're opening prize eggs, like just <laughs> one egg after another after another? If you don't get your kids to stop, they'll watch it for hours. <laughs> right? And, and then this is also a thing I didn't know was a thing until, you know, my kids got into this, whatever. It's, it's not playing with toys. It's watching other kids play with toys on YouTube. Like, that's a thing now. And it keeps their attention. It's, it's amazing the things that do keep our attention in this day and age, and yet we say, the worship of God can't keep my attention. Remind yourself of this. We're worshiping the sovereign God of the universe. If that can't keep your attention, I don't know what else would. Well, then the question comes up, is it really that important? Is it really something that we have to do. As I mentioned before, we say things like, well, we don't come to church. We are the church. That's a false dichotomy. That's a, those two things don't exist. They don't have to exist separate from one another. You can be the church and you can also come to church. Those are two things that go together. They're not opposing one another. Is it really, though, that important? It's my personal devotion with the Lord. That's what matters. Well, listen, I want to remind you this. Worship is at the heart of the Christian life. If you're not worshiping, you're not living for God. And yes, we worship God on the outside walls of this church as well. That's critically important. But it's also important that we gather, that we worship together, that we remind ourselves of these promises, that we study God's Word, that we pray faithfully for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we pray and we ask God to bless our lives and, and praise him for his wonderful graciousness and just thank God to take time and thank God every week and say, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Listen, that's so critically important. That's at the heart of the Christian life. John Popper said this, missions exist because worship does not. So there are areas of the world where God is not worshiped, and so we send missionaries to go to them. 
to teach them about the Bible, to share the gospel with them, to compel them to worship the sovereign, true, and living God. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. You're here to worship the Lord. There's definitely family worship and corporate worship, and and that's important. Corporate worship is the gathering of God's people here, and family worship should take place at home too. I was reading a book, Family Driven Faith by Valdi Bauckham, and he said this, our children are falling away because we are asking the church to do what God designed the family to accomplish. Discipleship and multi-generational faithfulness begins and ends at home. So yes, we need to worship God as a family. Family worship should be critical. I'm preaching to myself as well. It's personal, but it's also public. It's a declaration of who we are in Christ Jesus. There is no justification in the Bible whatsoever for a Christian to exist as an island unto himself. There is no verse, there is no passage of Scripture in any place in the Bible that tells us, well, you and Jesus, y'all just go and do your own thing and don't worry about anybody else. But time and time again, we're told that it's so important, so important that we worship God together, that we do life together, that we love the Lord together, that we pray faithfully for our brothers and sisters. And can I tell you this? Why is this a tool of the kingdom? This is a tool of the kingdom Because the end result is this. It strengthens our walk with the Lord. It reminds us of God's faithfulness and it feeds our soul. Man, when we come and when we gather around God's word, it feeds and nourishes our soul. And we are living in the middle of a dry and thirsty land, spiritually speaking. We need nourishment from the Lord. We're told in scripture to pray to the Lord to give us this day our daily bread. And listen, I love bread, but that is not the bread of this world. That is the bread of the kingdom. And we open up this book and we gather around this book and we proclaim God's promises. We sing about it. We pray about it. We preach about it. And we nourish our souls as we open up this wonderful and glorious book. We need that today. The Christian who doesn't Feed his soul with the word of God is a Christian who is dying spiritually and who is falling away from the plans of God. The worship of God is a tool so critically important in God's kingdom. Lastly, we see the word of God. In Joshua chapter 6, the tools that are there, the promises of God, the people of God, the worship of God, and the word of God. In the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments is traditionally just representing the laws of God that were given to the nation of Israel. But, but most importantly, it, it represented God's presence, as we said, but, but it represents what God has said, what God has spoken, the word of God. This is so important. We don't worship a book, but we worship the God of this book. And this God, our God has spoken. He's chosen to use words to communicate to us his divine will, his plan for our lives. John chapter one tells us in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the word. And this word ultimately has come to fruition in our lives as the Bible. The word was central here in Joshua chapter 6. The word was central to their trust in God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10 tells us this, that the word is living and active. Think about that for a moment. The word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces and it divides the soul and spirit, joint and marrow. Think about the power that that word has, what a tool in the hands of a powerful God. This word is able to analyze our lives. You know, there are times when I look at God's word and when I study God's word, and man, I'm sitting back in my study or I'm sitting in my devotional time and God just pierces my soul. He convicts me of my sin, of where I need to straighten up in my walk with the Lord. Or there are times 
when I'm sitting and I'm reading God's word and I'm really struggling and there are issues that I'm facing and there are, I'm down in the dumps and there are so many things that, that are overwhelming or concerning me and I pick up God's word and man, it lifts my spirits and lifts my soul. Takes me to a place above my problems and my issues and my concerns. Reminds me of a sovereign hand that is guiding me every step of the way. God's word is living and active. The author of God's word, the Holy Spirit, is working in our heart. Speaking to us as we read and as we study God's word. First Timothy, Paul tells us that it's good for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That you would apply this word to your life and that you would live according to this word. Here's the amazing thing. The church is a collection of different generations. Just as in Joshua chapter 6, there were different people, there were different groups of people, different generations, different tribes of people and everything else. And, And they are gathered around what God has spoken. God has said that this is true. That he's the one that's leading them and guiding them even to this day. You think about the church today, where we are, how we exist. We come from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic statuses, different family dynamics. And all of those are on display every time we gather, every time we come together as a church. We all have different ideas. You know, you take... 10 Baptists, you get 13 opinions, right? I mean, we have have all of these things. We're so different from one another, and yet yet we are coming together around the Word of God. And the church is a collection of different generations, but we all need the same thing. The same medicine is applied to my life that's applied to your life, and what that is is a regular diet of God's Word, regular diet of what God has said from Genesis to Revelation, just studying God's Word, allowing His Word to nourish our hearts and our souls, verse by verse, going through God's Word, understanding the context, the principles, the truths of God's Word, and applying them directly to our lives. This Word will change your life. If you pick it up and read it for yourself, what's included in God's Word How is it utilized as a tool? Well, there's different genres in God's Word. This is not all one type of literature. When you look at God's Word, it's a collection of different types of literature. There's law that's there, especially in the Old Testament. There are commandments that are given by God, especially the first five books of the Bible. It includes a lot of law, includes a lot of commandments, but these commandments are utilized for specific purposes. Paul says that the law still exists, it's still useful, for us to recognize our sin, for us to be able to understand where we fall short of the glory of God. When we read God's law, we understand that God's law is perfect, and we're not. But then there's also other aspects of Scripture that's so so useful, like poetry. When we read Psalms or Proverbs, and we read through some of these more poetic versions of Scripture and different genres, there, when we read these Verses, when we read these psalms, they speak directly to our heart. I mean, you ever, you ever been facing something, you picked up God's word, and you realized that God was speaking directly to you in that particular verse? Maybe it's a verse that you've read multiple times over, and yet God, God utilized that verse at that moment to just cut to your heart and speak to where you were. There's poetry in God's word. There's reasons why we sing the way that we do, because we sing in a way that is easy to remember. And they speak, we speak truths in, in short little phrases that, that we can go home and, and remind ourselves of these truths. We can sing about these truths. And so poetry is the same way. It's written in such a way that we would remember it, that it would speak to our heart, not just our minds. So there's law, there's poetry, there's prophecy in the Old Testament and New Testament. And Prophecy includes telling the future, but it also includes telling the truth, speaking to the heart of a particular issue. There's prophecy all in this book. And we see in so many different places, the promises of God come true from those prophecies of old. And it reminds us of God's faithfulness. 
when I read Isaiah 53 in comparison to the sacrifice of Christ, the coming of the Lord, and all that Jesus has done for us, it reminds me that God has a plan, and his plan is trustworthy. There's history in this book. When we read Joshua chapter 6, this is a historical story that is true, that is accurate. We can go back to learn about history, the history of the people of Israel. There are letters, epistles that are written to specific groups of people, letters like you and I would write today. Well, we started off with a salutation. We have the body of our letter. We have the ending of our letter. And there's a point to what we're saying and why we're writing. Paul and others are writing letters to other churches in the New Testament. And it's to a specific congregation, a local congregation. But so many times I read these letters and I think to myself, God, you're speaking some of the same things to us today. You're speaking as if it was written to Second Baptist in Cedartown. And we take these truths and we apply them directly to our lives and the lives of those in our churches. And then there's the Gospels. Oh, man. The Gospel is just the story of Christ. What a wonderful, glorious story it is to remind ourselves of this over and over and over again. The story of Jesus' birth, the story of his life, the story of his death, the story of his resurrection, the story of his ascension, the story that, that we remind ourselves, the prophecy that he is coming again. You know, the calendar for many uh, churches is focused on the life of Christ as we go in. Just next weekend, as we go into the season of Advent, we're living out the life of Christ through our worship and through the gathered assembly here at Second Baptist. We, we go through the birth of Jesus. We go through and remind ourselves an epiphany of, of all that God has done and his plan that was executed here on earth. We go through and we remind ourselves of Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection during Holy Week and Easter. And then we remind ourselves of dates like Pentecost. We live out, we try to live out this story over and over and over again as Christians have done for thousands of years. It's a good tool for us to use and apply directly to our lives. The tools of the kingdom are more powerful than the tools of this world. But we need to pick them up and use them. We need to apply them to our lives the way that they're rightfully supposed to be applied. As God guides us and leads us, I pray that we would do that today. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for 